Halski or Halso Vice is the first Ethereum public testnet launched after the merge of Ethereum blockchain. It is by far the largest POS testnet with 1.4 million validators set. If it intrigues you, continue watching. Welcome to Pee Penny episode 120. I am Pooja Ranjan with special guests from the Ethereum testing team with me to provide an overview of the newly launched Ethereum public testnet. Halski, announced in December 2022, is live since September 28, 2023. The testnet is expected to replace long-standing POA testnet Godly. To learn about this testnet, and the predictable Ethereum testnet lifecycle, we are joined by testing legends, Afri Shudon, Barnabas Busa, Paritosh Jayanti, and Philip. Welcome all. Hey, thanks for having us. Hey, uh, Hello. I'm super excited to dive <laughs> into the talk, but before that, could we have a brief introduction of our uh, guest for our new listeners? Hi, my name is Paritosh. I'm part of the DevOps team in the Ethereum Foundation, and I often help with protocol upgrades, figuring out testnets and how we safely upgrade Ethereum. Hi, I'm going to go next. Uh, my name is Barnabas. I'm also with the EF uh, DevOps team, and I'm also responsible for testing uh, different testnets and devnets. And you might have met me in the previous Pipani in Dencon testing. So hi everyone, I'm Philip. I'm also from the EF DevOps team. I've just joined recently and I'm mostly doing um, application development, so custom tooling and also related to Ethereum testing and upgrades. Yeah, and uh, last but not least, I'm Afri. I'm not with the Ethereum Foundation DevOps team. I'm actually at Chainsafe Systems. I'm head of protocol at Chainsafe. We develop software like Lodestar, the Beacon Chain um, consensus client TypeScript. And on the side, I have been doing public testnet infrastructure for a while now. Most prominently, I coordinated launching the Girly testnet a couple of years ago. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction. And it was really nice to know a little bit about your background, how you are uh, contributing to the Ethereum ecosystem. Our listeners may remember uh, we recently recorded a talk on Denkun testing with Paritosh, Parnabas, and Mario. If you missed, please check out the link available on your screen or check out our Denkun playlist at eCathodus YouTube and podcast. Moving on to today's topic, uh, which is Halski, let's peep in. Yeah, thank you. We'll kick this off with a little bit of an introduction to what Holeski is and why. So Holeshki is a public Ethereum testnet for everyone who has been around uh, with Ethereum for a couple of years. We had seen numerous uh, of testnets, most prominently testnets like Rubston or RingB, but also lesser known testnets like Coven or Gurley. And just a couple of weeks ago, we launched a new one. Um, Holeshki is a um, long st standing testnet. This means it comes with certain uptime guarantees. So if you want to stake on Holeshki, or if you want to run an application on Holeshki, you can be assured it will be also around a week later or a month later, or even a year later. What is new about Holeshki is the first network we launched after the so-called Ethereum merge. So we, for this instance, we did not launch a beacon chain and a con execution layer chain and then merge them, but instead we merged at Genesis. This means that Everything required was baked into the Genesis state and it started right from the first block as proof of stake. The main reason to launch this is to re replace the Gurley testnet. But why do we have to replace it? Gurley has been around for four years now, almost five years now. And when it was launched, the Ethereum ecosystem looked very differently. Proof of stake was a very distant fantasy back then. And our main Motivation to launch Gurley back in the day was much different. It was more about bringing together the different execution layer clients uh, on one public testnet and allowing developers to test the application stack across different hosts. 
And we just never really thought about how much testnet ESA would be required on a public testnet. So we just went with mainnet defaults. So I think we launched early with 150 million testnet ESA. Um, unfortunately, over time, Gurley testnet became more and more popular, especially with beacon chain testing and beacon chain testing or proof of stake in general required a lot of testnet ethers because you had to stake them on the testnet to run a testnet validator node. And this led to a point where Gurley testnet ether was so scarce that it was really hard to get and people started speculating. And at some point we were just literally out of Gurley testnet ether and we needed to sunset it to and make place for a new testnet. And yeah, it naturally reached end of life that way. This caused a lot of friction in the community, unfortunately, because people were deploying applications, were using it to stake and whatnot. And it turns out that applications on Ethereum are very complex nowadays. And there is also certain network effect. So if you want to, I don't know, want to trade tokens, you maybe need a decentralized exchange deployed. Or if you want to test out more complex deployments, you might need a layer two that's supporting this specific testnet. And all these big um, projects working on the testnet, they are not really happy that um, at some point the testnet can die or reach end of life or is even deprecated because it's a lot of work for them to migrate everything off and to a new testnet. So something uh, we proposed just earlier this year uh, is uh, a predictable Ethereum testnet lifecycle. The gist is that um, instead of arbitrarily deciding when a uh, testnet uh, reached end of life or had we need a new testnet even, uh, instead of doing this arbitrarily, we create a schedule where we say approximately every two years we launch a new one to replace the oldest one uh, on a defined date. And in addition to this, we also limit the timeline of testnets to approximately five years. And there's a little screenshot from a slide I uh, created for the Ethereum Berlin meetup a couple of months ago. You can see that we are now in the center there at 2023, and we now just launched Leshki. So this is a slide from the past. Uh, we now launched Leshki to replace not Sepolia, which is our application uh, testnet, but to replace Gurley our previous proof of stake testnet. Perfect. So before we launched uh, Holsky, we had to do some amount of preparation and some amount of tests. So the question was always, why not just launch it? Just have one individual set up a ton of nodes and call it a day. The problem with that was the sheer scale of things. We knew that Right now, we had no testnet that was bigger than mainnet, and that was an unhealthy way to do things. If we had hit a situation where the scale of the Ethereum beacon chain was just too big, we wouldn't have been able to hit that on a testnet beforehand. We would have hit it on mainnet to begin with. It's not how we would want to find out new bugs. So we needed a testnet that's really, really big. How big? We kind of wanted, let's say, three times the size of mainnet. That seemed like it gives you a lot of space, a lot of variability, right? The issue is that this gets extremely difficult for one entity to set up, and it doesn't teach us as much. If I was to sign up with some cloud provider, set up 400 nodes, set up 2 million validators, that's great, but that's not really indicative of mainnet at all. That's not indicative of how people set up their nodes. It doesn't actually help us learn enough about Ethereum. So for it to be really a valuable test at scale, we would need to involve the community. We didn't need to involve node operators. We need to involve client teams so that they also have a location where they can test their, their clients before it goes on mainnet and where they can test optimizations before it goes on mainnet. So there were a lot of hidden dragons. It's best to just sanity check everything before we got to the whole ski stage, right? But before we even got to the sanity checking, we had to kind of ask ourselves, okay, how do we actually know if the sanity checking for whole ski that we're doing works? Um, the typical answer is metrics. So every Ethereum client has a lot of metrics and you can scrape it with Prometheus. That's great, perfect. We have dashboards already that works for a lot of things. We also have this one tool that 
the EF DevOps team is built. It's called Satu. And Satu attaches to the event stream of the consensus layer node. And then it collects all the events that are being emitted by the consensus layer node. And it uses this to create a bunch of peer-to-peer level metrics. So we can know when blocks are being propagated around the network, when attestations are get, going through, et cetera. And you can use a host of Grafana dashboards, or you can use Jupyter notebooks or whatever you want for analysis. So we kind of had the tool to know if our sanity check is going to actually work. And just as a side note, there is a data collection grant running right now. So if you see this and the topic interests you, please do apply. We wanted to run a big test. Now we knew this is before we even do Holski, before we involve a lot of external participants, before we do all of that coordination. Internally, we wanted to know, can the beacon chain actually handle the size? And while setting that test up internally, we ran into a bunch of issues. The first one was just that the Genesis state is really big. We had assumed we wanted to do three times the size of mainnet. That was the proposal for Holski initially. And we tried generating the Genesis state on my laptop that would take hours and hours of processing for it to happen. Thankfully, a lot of it is parallelizable. We knocked on the security team's door nicely, and they have these really powerful fuzzing machines. And we asked if we could borrow them for a few hours, and they gracefully said yes. So we were able to generate the Genesis state in roughly two minutes, which would have taken hours on my laptop. We Same problem for the validator keys. You want to create over 2 million validator keys, not even to mention that you're going to go over like the file lock limit on most Linux systems. So you also have to change the U limit. There's like a few, quite a few random issues you hit that you have to keep fixing. The next one we hit was the state that ends up being generated is three to 400 MB, which means it's too big for GitHub. We had to then decide, okay, let's use S3 to distribute it. Same for the validator keys with my home internet. I think it would take me like five, six hours to even just upload the keys to all of these machines. Again, we switched to like an S3 based approach to do this. And we initially thought we would do equal client split. And then on some sanity checks, that wouldn't necessarily have made perfect sense either. We ran one test and we weren't able to make the network work. So we had to switch to a mainnet split. And we ran into resource limits on the first attempt. So we had to switch to far higher machines. So we were able to like knock out quite a few early on issues. So we knew when we were doing the actual Holski launch, we had better recommendations to go with to the community. We had better recommendations for size, what type of machine to use, what clients split should go, which clients might need more optimizations. We had all of this information already going in. Um, So we ran two big tests, each one with over 400 nodes. So the first one was, it's called Big Boy Beacon Chain. The first test had 2.1 million validators. And the data you're seeing is from Zatu. And I think the graph at the bottom kind of shows what the crux of the issue is. The average block propagation time is 15 seconds, but the average slot time in Ethereum is 12 seconds, which means the blocks aren't getting propagated fast enough for the average node to receive it before the next slot is happening. So maybe the answer would have been more compute would have solved it. I don't know, but we were already using quite compute heavy machines. Maybe there were other optimizations we were missing. We're actually not completely sure, but it's felt like the beacon chain was stressed at this level with 2.1 million validators. We're struggling without any optimizations, of course, which is understandable. We're going for a client that is meant to be running 600,000 validators and suddenly giving it three times, four times the load. So the sanity check already told us, okay, maybe we shouldn't do Holski with 2.1 million validators. Let's not waste all of this time coordinating something that's going to fail completely in the beginning. But at the same time, we wanted to have something that is bigger than mainnet that we can actually use as an optimization target. So we tried with double the size of mainnet. So we went with Big Boy Beacon Chain 2. This had 1.4 million validators. It had a complete mainnet split. So we used 
tools like Michael Sprouse Blockprint. We used a few other online client diversity tools to just get the magic numbers as to what clients are represented in a certain way on mainnet. And we applied the exact same logic on our testnet. And surprisingly, that worked really well. There's a couple of graphs later on where we also show how mainnet looks, but essentially you're looking at blocks being proposed maybe half a second later than mainnet or a quarter a second later than mainnet, which is well within tolerance limits. You essentially, whenever you look at these EF DevOps graphs from attestations, you need a thick red band. That means things are going great. The less red, the worse the network is performing. That's an easy way to look at these heat maps. And this doesn't look too bad. We, based on the tests, we thought, okay, 1.4 million validators works. We had, we decided what size of nodes we should recommend to people. We decided how wide we want the network to be. We decided what client splits would make more sense. We got a lot of information that we wanted to, that then at least sets Holsky up for success whenever we came to it. And I will pass it on to Barnabas to talk about the actual Holsky launch. Yeah, so what went actually wrong at the first time? Because we actually planned to launch Holsky on the 15th of September at 2 p.m. UTC, if I recall correctly. The issue was that we have included an extra field data, which was the hash that you can see at the screen, which was translating for how much is the fish. This extra data is was generated was added post the generation of the Genesis file, which resulted an invalid head hash between the CL and the EL. Therefore, none of the clients were able to produce any valid blocks. Later on the day, we figured this out and we tried to resurrect the Oski chain. But at that point, because we have 15 to 20 or even 30 different node operators, it was just too much effort and too much energy to try to resurrect the chain. So we decided in a relaunch for the 28th of September. I hope I got the dates correct. Uh, <laughs> so what we did is we launched just a couple of weeks ago, and currently the chain is doing very well. We have a participation rate of about 90, 85 to 90% which means that majority of the network is healthy. Blocks are coming in, validators are attesting to their blocks and everyone is able to participate in the network also. If you want to join in, you can see that we have pending validator zero and exiting validator zero. So as soon as you make a deposit, after your deposit reaches the beacon chain, then the deposit will be voted in and will be included to become a participant. As we are planning to keep this chain alive for five years, we wanted to make sure that all the node operators that are participating in the Genesis event are trustworthy. And that enabled us to ensure that we're going to have a high participation rate at Genesis. On the next page, uh, you will see participation rate by the different operator. The more green the line is, the better the operator is. And here you can see that most of the validator operators are actually attesting in time and without missing a beat. Because we have so many validators per node operator, it's quite easy to over-provision yourself and think that, yeah, you can run 5,000, 10,000 node per validator client, but actually it might not perform as well as you might have thought before. So this is a very good experiment for all these large operators to push the limits of the client software that they are using. Here you can see a comparison between the mainnet and the Holsky chain uh, in terms of block propagation. So the block propagation takes uh, roughly a few milliseconds faster on Holsky. And this is most likely because the number of nodes that are in the network. So in Holsky, we estimate to have around 200 to 250, maybe even 300 nodes, but that's uh, very, very small portion of how many nodes there are on the mainnet. And this is just the general latency in the internet. And here you will see a uh, attestation propagation time for Holsky uh, versus mainnet. And uh, you can see that the attestation propagation times are actually 
a bit smoother on mainnet compared to Hosky, and this is because of even if a single node goes offline, it could take off a significant portion of uh, every other node's connection, and therefore uh, reducing the overall reliability of the network. Let's say so. Polsky just after Genesis was uh, at 78% participation rate, and currently we are at around 90%, 90 plus percent, and the network is uh, slowly growing. We, we don't plan to onboard any other large operator, maybe a few thousand here and there, but we would like to keep it as stable as possible before the Duncan fork. This is to ensure that Duncan will go as smoothly as possible where we can do some performance testing afterwards. So that's what I'm going to be talking about next. What is next for Hosky and Gurley? So the next fork is called Denkun, which will introduce the blob functionality that we have talked in the previous PIP. And uh, we plan to use Hosky and Gurley to stress test the blob propagation before we can go to any other public test nets. And, uh, Denkun will likely be the last upgrade for Gurley. So this is a wake-up call for all the large third-party operations, like uh, those that run uh, RPC endpoints or run a whatever service on Gurley, uh, please migrate to either Polsky or Sepolia, preferably to both. And uh, then you will be covered for everything. And in this slide, you can see a few uh, interesting uh, URLs. If you want to join the Hosky uh, chain, I recommend you to visit hosky.itpendabs.io. There you can find a bunch of information about all these URLs that you see listed here. Just to mention a few of them, we have a public RPC, which is just rpc.hosky.itpendabs.io, a beacon chain explorer run by the Bitfly team, a Dora explorer, which is a brand new lightweight beacon chain explorer, and it was developed by Philip in our team. We have an official launchpad from the Ethereum Foundation and a quick start guide that I've wrote up so it, it can help you get onboarded into Holski. So how does the funding work on Holski? A lot of users um, that took a look into the network might already have noticed that they already, already have about 1,000 Holski ETH in their wallets. These funds have been distributed by the initial fund distribution system that we've prepared for the Holesky launch. The idea of that system was quite simple. Um, instead of having all the supply allocated to a small group of persons, we wanted to give more users direct access to funds with the Holesky launch. So they can directly start deploying contracts or share funds with other people or doing stuff they like on the new, on the new network without going through the faucets every time. The usual way to do that would be to add all these uh, wallets that have an interest to the Genesis state, so to get, have these funds allocated up front. Unfortunately, that led to a problem because the Genesis state is baked into um, client executables like Geth. The high amount of um, Genesis allocations would just load up the executable size, with it, which is not really acceptable for testnets. So instead of doing that, we've organized an airdrop-like approach where we've dropped um, 1,000 each um, directly to about 500,000 wallets after the network launched. And that list of these wallets was um, composed by the GrabTief team, um, which prepared that list for a big girly airdrop earlier this year. Yeah, it contains uh, all wallets that deployed one or more contracts on girly, Mainnet or Sepolia before November 15th, 2022. So that was actually a cutoff date uh, a year ago. So all contracts that deployed the contract before that date should have got the 1K uh, Holeshki ETH drop. Technically, that uh, airdrop was prepared by generating about uh, 10,000 pre signed transactions, where each of these transactions uh, actually contained 50 transfers, which made that process uh, quite much more gas is efficient and faster. Actually, the world pro distribution process took about six hours to get all transactions confirmed in the network. The world drop distributed about 20% of the network supply and overall worked pretty well so far. So apart from that initial fund distribution, we also thought about a new process to give projects with an ongoing need for funds access to these funds in an automated way. 
Um, the usual process for that is basically pinging random DevOps people and client team guys and back for funds. That has really been annoying in earlier test nets. I've actually felt, felt the same as I'm running the POV for set and had to ping random DevOps people every time my faucet got empty. So instead of continuing that process, we would like to try a new contract-based approach on Holeshki. For that, we've prepared a contract that allows requesting specific amounts of funds uh, whenever operator needs it. The requestable amount is time-based. So someone that has been granted uh, 10,000 ETH per month can decide himself when and how much fund he needs to request from the contract up to that uh, granted limit of 10,000 ETH, of course, of course. Actually, that process is not 100% complete yet. We are still working on figuring out the last data details. So we'll share more details about how to apply for such an ongoing grant pretty soon. So for everyone else, like regular developers, staking, stakers, or other guys that are, there are various facets available. Collecting funds from these facets is much easier compared to Gurley, Sepolia, or other networks. So it should be suitable to cover funding needs for regular activity. I've actually um, put together a few of the live facets that are actually working on the network on here. You can see actually four facets and there are also more facets that uh, will come up in the next weeks. So. Awesome. And what's next is, like Afri said, we've just launched Holski. That means in two years, we're going to launch the next testnet. We don't have a name. And I think two years is enough time to bike shed the next name. So feel free to start bike shedding. I think the only requirement is that no one should be able to pronounce it. But as long as you hit that requirement, you're okay. And thank you. Follow us on your favorite social media if we're present there. And help us test the surge. Wonderful talk. Thank you so much for the team effort here. Thank you, Afri, for adding background and context for why Halski. Uh, Pari for adding this uh, large uh, validator sets information. And I was curious to know about Zatu. So thank you for including that information. Uh, Barnabas uh, sharing the details of operators during the Halski launch. And I was like fascinated to see all those metrics that you guys have been tracking. Kudos to the team. Philip, uh, I think you answered one of the burning questions uh, coming up from DAP developers community about funding of the test E. Uh, thank you for sharing all these resources. I think I would like to start this question answer session with the first question, and that is with respect to the naming. If any one of you would like to let us know how it was named as Holski. Maybe I can say Exus. There was a hackathon project last year at East Prague that was hacking on a Virgil Tree testnet and they named it Olesovich, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they actually won the hackathon with that and um, they kept uh, working on this initiative. And But their cycle of working on this testnet was at some point over. It was not a public testnet. And when we discussed new uh, public testnets, um, they actually brought this name up as it, as it could be used as a, in a public context. And um, the fun fact is that we did not go with the long name, but with a short version, the Holeshki version. And this created some tension in the community, but I think everyone should be happy now. That is interesting to know. And uh, I would again like to remind what uh, Pari just said. If you are suggesting some name, make sure it is very difficult to pronounce. <laughs> At All this right. point, we should just lean into that. I think it's just part of the ethos. <laughs> right. I mean, I remember when uh, the team were coming up with uh, different names for uh, merch. That was like on Japanese side. <laughs> so this is good to know. I think even uh, I only learned how to pronounce the Roopston testnet na uh, name at the call we had when we were shutting down the testnet. So... <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> All right. My next question is with respect to the permission of joining this network. So as we know, Halski is an Ethereum test network with permissionless validator set. Does it mean it is open for anyone to join as validator following the instructions uh, shared by the team? I'm asking this question because Barnabas mentioned about uh, 
a hesitating in onboarding large validator set at the moment? Is it only about the large validator set or is it also applicable to small and individual validator willing to join the chain? We would like to onboard as many individuals as possible, but what we want to limit is onboarding you know, 500,000 more validators right now, because we don't want to make the chain to become unstable. So the general idea is if you would like to run a validator or two, that's not a problem. Come on, we have the faucet set up. You can request all the false key that you want, and you can make a deposit right away using the launchpad. It's a seamless experience when it comes to getting validated on Hosky. So we, we don't want to stop anyone from using a faucet and making deposits to Hosky right now. We, we wouldn't want to onboard a very large portion as of right now. So we, we don't want to grow this validator chain by a huge number of validators. But a few here and there is it's not going not, not going to change anything. Yeah. And the main reasoning is that we still want to have some time for client teams to test out whatever optimizations they want to make and kind of let the chain grow more organically. So at one time, we don't want to onboard 500,000 validators. Maybe we always do 5,000 here, 10,000 there, and eventually make it a bigger chain. Also, if you're a smaller validator who just wants to test out how deposits work, et cetera, please have a look at the ephemery testnet. The logic over there is that the testnet resets itself after, I want to say, two weeks. Yeah, so two weeks. Um, so you can test it out, run it at home, make sure that everything looks great. And in two weeks, it's gone. You can use that machine for whatever else you want to do. So you can, without any problems, try stuff out there. That makes a lot of sense. My next question is with respect to the growing of chain. As you mentioned that the team is not willing to like rapidly grow the chain suddenly. I remember there is a proposal, a 7514, uh, which is add max epoch churn limit. Do you think when this uh, testnet is uh, ready to test Duncan, growing chain suddenly would help test this proposal effectively? For sure. Yeah, I think that was also pretty much some of the basis for the big boy beacon chain tests. Like a lot of the data that was collected there went into supporting evidence for EIPs like the one you mentioned, where we kind of see, okay, there's a problem. We're not there yet. We still have plenty of leeway, but we can't ignore the problem. We have to deal with it eventually. So I think, yes, when the proposal is ready, Holsky would make perfect sense. Regarding 7514, the churn limit change, uh, hopefully next week we're going to be able to launch DevNet 10, which will be the first uh, DevNet that will test this uh, functionality out. Good to know. Yeah, I was about to ask, like, is it possible to get it tested in any of the DevNet, though it is like not that large validator site? So, yeah. We, we, yeah, we're, we're doing, to... yeah. We're doing a bit smaller one. So we're going to use 330,000 validators and we're going to, so 330,000 is just a slight over the limit of four. So we just go into the five churn and then we're going to be limited back to four. So we are going to make the deposits and exits at the same time. And we're going to monitor if the churn limit effect at Dancun will actually take effect or not. And it should. Hopefully, the results will be in favor. It's already been long testing period for testing team. So I hope they do not face more challenges over here. Uh, all right. I am curious to understand the launch. As it was mentioned during the presentation, that there were two launch. One, we wanted to get it done on 15th of September, which was not very successful. There was a mention of some additional data added to the file in Genesis file. I'm curious, the second launch, what did it change other than this config file extra data thing? Was the change of validator set decided for the second launch or it was decided earlier? Everything is exactly the same except the extra data is not gone. So we changed the Genesis time. We regenerated the Genesis SSZ file and we left everything as exactly the same. 
Yeah, and just some more color on the previous one. We have a lot of automation scripts that generate all of these files. So earlier we ran those scripts and then manually changed one field. So the second time around we ran those scripts and then we didn't touch them. So that was pretty much the only change that had to happen. Good to know. Uh, well, my next question is with respect to the timeline. So is there any agreement of timeline to move to the public testnet? Barnabas mentioned about DevNet 10. I would be curious to hear the status of DevNet 10. Is it live right now? Are we going to have it uh, done soon? And if so, uh, how do we see the public testnet coming into the picture? So DevNet 9 is currently live and we should hopefully be able to launch DevNet 10 next week. We are still work in progress regarding the KCG ceremony that has ended in the end of August. And once the KCG ceremony file is ready, then the clients can make a release and then we can start uh, testing with those releases and test everything like it would go out to a public testnet. So I cannot tell you exactly when we're going to be hitting the first public testnet. All I can say is coming soon. Yeah, I think DevNet 10 would be one of the last few DevNets we have. We might do one more Shadow Fork, but at least for Cancun, it shouldn't play a big role. I think Shadow Forks would play a bigger role in future forks, but because it's so heavy on the peer-to-peer -peer layer, it we're not necessarily testing the load of block production on Shadow Forks. So Aside from DevNet 10, it's more about smaller scale test nets where we can break things in ways that we want. We have some cool tooling that's under development for peer-to-peer -peer testing. And if the tooling doesn't find anything, then we're kind of ready for public test nets. Great to know. I'm just curious. Uh, I understand that we had been talking about like feature complete DevNets. What is going to be different in this DevNet? Like, is it the KZZ thing or were we not able to put all the EIPs for testing before? Uh, 7514 was accepted as a EIP that we were going to Dancun, I think three weeks ago. So it was a very lost addition to the Dancun EIPs. So that's why it's not something that we have even considered testing before because it was not part of the set that we decided to be in Denkun. And we needed some preparation. We have to think about like how many validators we want to run, how we actually want to test it. And that's why we just decided, okay, let's just launch DevNet 9 with the limited number of validators where we can just deposit one or two validators if you want to test that. But DevNet 10 should have all the EIPs with all the final KCG files included, as it will see on the public testnet. So that is the idea. We also had two relatively useful and stable sets for earlier testnets, testing tools ready at the end of September. So we had a bad block generator that Marius had built, and we also got updated TX fuzz for blobs. So that's a transaction fuzz, but for blobs. And both of those are known to cause a lot of chaos and having a very big testnet is not known to be easy to debug. So DevNet 9 is small. So we wanted to deploy these tools here, break whatever we can. It's a small set. We can check what's going wrong. And I think we did also catch a few bugs. We also got a few memory leaks. And so all of that has now been taken care of. So we're feeling more and more ready to move to the next phase, which is a bigger testnet where we're confident things won't break as easily and we won't have to struggle with debugging it. That was a big one. And I think the second one was there were still some final considerations with how the trusted setup file would look, et cetera. So that's all taken care of now. There's instructions on how you can generate the trusted setup file yourself, and then it just needs to go into client releases. So technically, DevNet 9 would test every single thing that goes on mainnet, and we're hoping that it's stable. Yeah, and there's also another tool that Philip has been building, in case he wants to have <clears throat> a quick mention. Uh, yep, it's also a blob testing tool, which basically does more than just fuzzing. It does um, replacement tra uh, blob transactions, cancellation or conflicting blob transactions, and basically also does that via, various, via multiple RPC endpoints to test the distribution of blobs between nodes. So that's an additional tool. 
for blob testing there and is also running on DevNet 9. So we're trying to unleash kind of everything we have on DevNet 9 and thankfully it hasn't broken too badly. Yeah, most of the bugs that we're catching now are all execution layer created bugs. I'm curious to hear about a 7516, the blob base fee. Have we tested it on nine or planning to test it on 10? I think the easiest one is to look up at your spec document. So Barnabas maintains this amazing spec document per testnet. So you know exactly which EIP is being tested in which testnet. Yeah, the one that has been linked there. Uh, yeah, pretty sure 7516 has been already included. So that, that is- Yeah, a, it should be. Uh, yeah, blob base fee on code, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious because these two were the last minute additions. So we talked about one four, was curious where one six stands there. All right, so that is great. Um, I know Holsky wasn't started like with the beacon chain, right? It started with Genesis and because it was after they merged and it's progressing towards different upgrades that happen on execution and consensus side. I'm curious, is it ready? for ten Dencon right now, or if not, uh, on which upgrade we are. Do we have any estimates of how long will it take to be Dencon ready testnet? Yeah, so the idea of Hosky was to launch it with Bellatrix Genesis. So Bellatrix Genesis is the merged Genesis file. We wanted to push for that as soon as possible so we don't have to worry about the proof of work mechanisms that the previous uh, testnets have required. So we decided to go with that and deprecate all the previous methods of how we created the Genesis file. And going forward, all the following devnets and possibly new testnets are going to be using a Capella Genesis, which means that we don't need to go through Capella at all. But for Holsky, this was not ready by all the different clients at that point. So that's why we decided to go with the safer method of going with the Bellatrix Genesis for Capella at Epoch 256, and then set the NAB at a later stage, which is not yet defined. We haven't decided if we're going to be forking Girdly or Holsky first. Most likely it's going to be Girdly first, because if something breaks, it, we prefer if it breaks on Girdly first. And then we're going to probably move to Holsky and Sapolia. But this is not the official timeline. It's, it's just an estimate for now. I was about to ask, like, what is the order that we are looking at? So it's going to be Gorley, then Holsky, and then Sepolia. Got it. I think that's the one that we're at least pushing for, because the proposal currently states you want three, six blobs, so six being the max. But a lot of testing that we've done is not necessarily indicative of how it would perform on mainnet. And one of the places where it would be closer to how it would perform on mainnet are proper public test nets. So we would want to take a baseline measurement of how Gurley is doing, have the fork with 3.6, see how stable Gurley is, and based on that information, try and extrapolate better how mainnet would work. And we would get two chances for this. So we would do Gurley as well as Holsky. And if Gurley is great, then we move to Holsky with 3.6. If Gurley is bad, then we move to Holsky with potentially a different number. All right. It's always better to be safe. So the approach, I really appreciate that. My next question is with respect to Gorley testnet. I remember Afri mentioned in the presentation about like we would be deprecating Gorley testnet. So is it going to be like end of the life or is it going to be open for public that if they want, they can perhaps maintain it just like we did it with Robston? Um, I mean, it's not really officially being deprecated, but inofficially because it's de facto unusable and people still use it, but everyone knows this is not going nowhere. So inofficially it's being deprecated already, but to set a new, to set a day very officially say we will soft launch this or we will uh, just stop using this, um, we, we basically want to wait for Holeski to be very stable for at least a couple of weeks. So I think this is something that might happen in the next weeks. So I'm not sure if there's any concrete plan, but I personally envision that we should 
stop using or stop supporting girly rather soon rather than later. It costs also a lot of money to support this, like not only the infrastructure is running on, but also all the applications that are on it. So, yeah, but I suspect that we will learn about this very soon. I don't know if, if people at ECU Foundation have more context here, but this is how I understand it. Yeah, I think most of what you said is exactly the context we have as well, mainly because it's also a permissionless network. So just because I turn off my validators, I will eventually be leaked out. And if you keep your validators on, you take over the chain. So if someone feels like they want to maintain the chain, they're more than happy to. I think at some date, we would just recommend whoever doesn't want to support Gurley anymore does the good thing and exits their validators. And whoever's left, if they feel like keeping Gurley around, there's nothing we can do to stop it. Some clients might will stop supporting Gurley eventually. I don't see yeah. it happening anytime soon. Yeah. But as updates will come and go, Gurley will yeah. most likely not receive another larger fork. Yeah. Unless we need to do something very quick and we will still have Gurley around become to to have a healthy test net to still uh work something but i i just don't see that happen and maybe also to, to add with the funding situation on girly it's actually way easier to use hoshi or sepolia for anything so yeah switch over to these networks yeah. <laughs> if you want to run a validator go to hoshi because you cannot go yep. to sepolia yeah. <laughs> And Afri also mentioned the default Genesis allocation on Gurley, right? It was roughly the same as mainnet. I think in Polsky, we did roughly 20 times that of mainnet or even more than 20 times. I think it's like 6 billion Polsky ETH or something like that. So there's significantly more ETH in circulation to begin with. And there's a smaller pressure because we already have a chain of 1.4 million sounds like certainly a bad news for people who have accumulated a lot of godly ETH in order to sell it to DAP team. <laughs> it's bad time for them. <laughs> but good for us that we have alternative, we have better solution available for DAP developers to switch to. Talking about better solution, Barnabasi mentioned about the documentation. I'm curious, is this documentation available for all DAP developers who are willing to move from Gorly to Holsky testnet as well? No, it's mainly to how to get started running a different client. So we don't actually give any hands in, in terms of migration. We expect the different teams to be responsible to deploy their application on Hosty, as well as if, if they do it for Gurley, it's going to be the same as de deploying it on that. So just because there's a new testnet, it shouldn't mean that all third-party application development should stop, so. All right. Yet I think that it would be really helpful for, uh, you know, DAP developers to have a similar guide available, made available. Uh, we have been recommending people to move from Gorli to Sepolia and Holsky. So once we are like done with all these upgrade things and we find that it is stable, even testing DAP is now okay there, we can have a document around. Was there any moment during the bring up phase when you thought, we're not going to make it and how did you overcome the difficulties? During the first launch attempt, after the third or fourth missed slot, it was clear we had a problem and that we weren't going to make it. Thankfully, it wasn't a critical issue in the end and had an easy fix. The big beacon chain tests also had quite a few moments where we were worried we had found limits of the beacon chain, which would have far-reaching implications. Thankfully, we also found that we have a decent headroom to fix the issues. Is there a DevOps secret whole sky F stash? Every client team as well as EF DevOps and plenty of external entities got a Genesis allocation to make it easier to allocate to faucets etc. It isn't a secret though and can be found in the Genesis file. Any new DevOps magic that you rolled out for this testnet? We wanted to keep it boring this time around. Basically, what you see in the 4844 DevNets is what was used in whole sky launch.
I know this is about time to wrap up all these conversation. I wonder if people have messages for someone who is interested to contribute to DAP developers, validators community, and anything that you would like to share with all our PPE listeners. I think a big one is that over the years, there's been so many guides, et cetera, that have used Gurley as the default. We need a ton of help changing that default so that when someone just Googles, how do I deploy something? Let the first answer not be to use a test method that's deprecated. That would help tremendously. So please have bright stuff. Control F, Gurley, replace, Polsky. It should be really that easy because all the clients support exactly the same flags. So everything is, in theory, really should be just that easy. It was really lovely talking to you all. And um, before we wrap up this call, I want to share a fun fact of the beginning of my personal journey in the Ethereum space. Um, very few people know this. I'm not sure if uh, Afri remembers this or not. In January 2019, an announcement was published on ECH Medium inviting contributors. One of the reach out to person was Afri. I DM'd him on Gitter and he pointed me towards the Ethereum cat headers Gitter. Indeed, I received support from Lane, Hudson, Charles, Tim, and many others to work with, and I'm very grateful to all of them. At the end of the day, I am with the Ethereum CAT herders. One of the reasons is because Afri Shadun didn't hesitate to point me towards the correct channel. I never got the opportunity to express my gratitude. I suppose today is the day. So Afri, thank you for being so kind and helpful to me and the Ethereum community. I suppose the Ethereum CAT herders is one of the best things that happened to me. <laughs> Thank you. And you're more than welcome. I would do it again. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is just my story. I know many contributors in the Ethereum ecosystem have been believed and supported by someone. And thus, we have this amazing ecosystem around. Pari, Barnabas, Afri, on behalf of the entire Ethereum Catholics team, we thank you all for joining us today and share about the latest public testnet. We wish you the best for Dancon testing and hope for a successful mainnet deployment. On this note, thanks to all our YouTube viewers for watching and podcast subscriber for listening to the special episode on the Eat Cat Herders channel. Should you have any question on this or any other topic, let us know at Eat Cat Herders Discord. Check out the description for more info. We'll be back with another interesting talk. Until next time, keep watching, keep listening, and keep sharing your love with Ethereum Cat Herders. Cheers. <laughs>